All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dominique McCoy, and on behalf of our team at the Two and Through Project, our co-authors at the UChicago Consortium on School Research, and our colleagues at the Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy, and Practice, I'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar uh, for the release of our annual update on the educational attainment of Chicago public schools. Uh, so this year's report on the 2022 outcomes uh, for CPS students represents the ninth iteration of the educational attainment update. Uh, this year's report, again, is going to be provided in our interactive web page format, uh, link for which should be in the chat, um, and which also features a downloadable uh, PDF uh, for folks that are still interested in uh, uh, being one of our, our readers, uh, like a traditional report. So uh, getting up to, excited for you to take an opportunity to take a look at that. Um, at Two and Through in the Consortium, we also believe that data is, is really a starting place and a really powerful resource that can inform some of the intentionality, collaboration, strategic work um, that we as a city have seen is possible when it comes to building more equitable college pathways for CPS students. And so to that end, we also wanted to point you all to a few accompanying resources that are available today that provide differentiated opportunities to make sense of some of this updated data that we'll be talking about in today's report. So first uh, is our two and three milestones tool that provides an opportunity to look at similar outcomes data for every elementary school, high school, or by the 77 community areas uh, in Chicago where CP uh, CPS students live. This is a powerful and public resource that is really intended to help put data in the hands of people like yourselves who are working alongside young people to help them reach their college aspirations. Um, using this tool alongside today's report uh, provides an opportunity for us to make sense of how some of these larger trends that we're seeing uh, across uh, our district and our system may be applying or may not be applying to the students that you care about and the students that you are serving in your local schools or communities. Um, this tool provides opportunities to explore this outcomes data across time and through disaggregations uh, that we hope will help to continue to help us identify supports that are working um, and to continue wor working to improve student experiences um, and organize responses to areas of opportunity that we can identify through the data. Uh, additionally, I'd also like to highlight our continually growing series of student stories. Uh, these are qualitative dives into the pathways of real CPS graduates that aim to elevate the lived experiences of our young people navigating life after high school, their perspectives on the supports that worked for them, and what they would like to see in place for CPS graduates who are uh, coming after them. Uh, we're going to be following their pathways. Uh, these qualitative data resources uh, provide powerful perspectives um, on the real experiences of CPS students navigating the pathways we're going to be talking about today. Um, they're created to uh, also help us uh, continue to develop insights and inform how we respond to students' needs. So I uh, hope that uh, folks get an opportunity to take a look at both of those resources um, and again, get an opportunity to engage with it with some of the, the data in the report that we'll be talking about today. Uh, so a quick look at our agenda. Um, after our brief research presentation from our report authors that will provide an update on this year's post-secondary attainment index, a uh, deep dive into the components that make up that index, and a look at some of the opportunities for continued progress. We are uh, really excited uh, that we are going to have the opportunity to be joined uh, by Chief Education Officer of Chicago Public Schools, by Dona Shekimbova, and the Chancellor of City Colleges of Chicago, Juan Salgado, who will be providing some brief remarks um, that uh, we're, we're hoping can help us um, shed some light on some of the work that's been happening at their respective institutions that have helped to influence some of the outcomes that we're seeing today. Then as a reminder, for those of you who RSVP'd, uh, you should have received an invite to our post-event discussion. Um, this is an optional opportunity that will happen after this webinar. Uh, to join our research team and your fellow attendees uh, to engage in some conversation around some of the data that we're going to be talking about today and uh, have a focused conversation around our collective opportunities to respond uh, to what we're seeing in the report. Um, we will also be sharing a link to that uh, separate Zoom room for those that are interested at the conclusion of this webinar. 
Finally, uh, we do have a very tight agenda in our 60 minutes. Uh, so I want to make sure I draw everyone's attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to share your questions throughout the presentation. We have team members uh, standing by and ready to answer questions in real time. Um, so please feel free to keep those questions coming in. We will do our best to answer as many as we can. Um, and then finally, all attendees will be receiving a, a recording of this presentation. Uh, and with that, uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the co-authors co of this year's report, uh, Jenny Nagaoka, Shelby Mahaffey, and Alexandra Usher, who will be providing us with the research presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Dom. Um, as I've said before, um, the release of the CPS attainment rates is one of my favorite days of the year. Um, I really like it because it gives us a chance to take a step back, reflect on our collective efforts to provide educational um, pathways for the young people in Chicago, um, and celebrate the hard work we've done and the achievements of young people. It's also a time when we consider where we've fallen short and where we need to go next. Um, this year is also a chance to check in how students who experience remote learning during the pandemic um, are doing in terms of attainment. You know, we've been hearing so much about the ways that students and school staff have been struggling. Um, but spoiler alert, um, attainment in Chicago is a bright spot of how resilient our students really are. Um, this year is also an important moment for thinking about college um, because the level of skepticism around college is rising. Um, many of you have probably read Paul Tuff's article in the New York Times that highlighted questions that people have been raising about whether or not a college degree pays off and given how and given how the, the rising rates of college, um, you know, is going to college a gamble, you know, and these are valid concerns. Um, but as, you know, as the patterns we see here, here in Chicago indicate, students also understand that the difference in salaries for someone who's graduated from high school and someone who's graduated from college is actually rising. And the value of college goes far beyond employment where it gives students um, experiences and possibilities for young people in their future. Um, next slide. So I wanted to start off by just giving you um, a little bit of context for the role the consortium and to and through have played over time. Um, we, we often point to the beginning of a lot of efforts um, in Chicago around college access and completion to a 2006 Chicago Tribune headline um, that grew out of the Chicago port that really galvanized the community um, in Chicago to really be thinking about how can we better support our students, given how few um, of our students will ultimately get a bachelor's degree. Um, and then on the research side, um, the consortium continued to produce research that helped guide the efforts that were happening inside and outside of the Chicago public schools, including um, our 2000 and Eight report, I think, um, potholes on the road to college. Um, and then for the past nine years, as Dom mentioned, the To and Through project has been providing publicly available online data um, that highlights you know, what's going on in each high school. We also do this by community area to understand what the patterns of um, educational attainment. And it's really been this rich resource for practitioners inside of schools and the public more generally about the outcomes of students in the Chicago public schools. Um, and I'm also um, really excited to be hearing from um, CCC Chancellor Salgado and CPS Chief Education Officer Chikambova about to hear more about the efforts that have been happening um, right now in Chicago that really shape the numbers that Alex and Shelby will be sharing with you. And I'm particularly excited because I think there's this unprecedented time in our history and education in Chicago with through the Chicago Roadmap Partnership that's happening right now between CPS and CCC. And before we move into the research presentation, um, I wanted to share with you a quote that comes from um, the to and through equity stance, just to help you kind of understand why it is that we really think it's important for us to be revisiting the same sets of numbers each year. You know, in this quote, I think it really highlights how we see ourselves as having an important role in the larger ecosystem around college and a college access and college completion in our city, you know, and why we do this report and share these numbers. 
Um, the data we share makes public and transparent how well the collective efforts inside and outside of schools are doing to support students to and through high school, to and through college. And an important part of this is making sure that we do not shy away from sharing patterns of disparities and raise critical questions so we can engage in more focused discussions about what we can do better. I also want to emphasize that the descriptive numbers Alex and Shelby will be sharing with you paint an important story, but they do not provide answers about why we see these patterns. I also want to note about the larger context of the patterns that we'll be seeing, um, particularly by race and ethnicity, are a product of the long history in Chicago of systemic racism that has included the intentional and unintentional economic and educational disinvestments in communities and schools of color. Um, a part of our equity stance is to hold ourselves and the people who use this data um, to have a shared responsibility of working toward change and to not ascribe the outcomes that we're describing to the choices and capacities of students, their families and communities, particularly for people of color. We encourage you to take the descriptive data we share with you today in context and conversation with other research and your own experiences in the field, especially in discussions with young people. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Shelby. Thank you so much, Jenny, for that context and that reminder. I think that's always really important for us to have in mind as we look at descriptive data like this. Um, so what we're gonna do now is first dive into the 2022 post-secondary attainment index that we're releasing in this year's report. And then we'll take a closer look at each one of the component rates that make up that index. So the post-secondary attainment index itself is an estimate of what CPS students' future attainment would look like under current rates of high school graduation, current rates of college enrollment and current rates of college completion. So we combine the most recent rate on each of those metrics to estimate what proportion of current ninth graders would go on to complete any credential within 10 years if all of the rates did not change over the next decade. So I think it's really important to note that this is not a prediction of what we think will happen. Um, this is not our expectation of what will happen. We hope that the work that everyone here today is doing will result in more students than this graduating over the next 10 years. We calculate this index, which is based on current rates, to show how all of the pieces, high school graduation, college enrollment, college completion, fit together to form one story of post-secondary attainment for CPS students. And we hope that thinking about students' trajectories through this framework can help us both identify individual intervention points in post-secondary attainment um, and also understand and track our overall progress over time as a district and as a city. So the 2022 PAI that we're releasing this year uses high school graduation from 2022, which is uh, corresponds to the 2018 to 19 freshman cohort college enrollment from 2022 and um, six year college completion which includes bachelor degree completion, as well as completion of associate degrees and certificates um, for 2015 high school graduates. So with all that in mind, let's start walking through the components of the 2022 PAI. Um, and we're gonna do that by imagining a hypothetical cohort of 100 freshmen as they walk through the different metrics of the PAI. So based on the current rates, if we started with 100 current freshmen, we would expect that 84 of those students would go on to graduate from high school based on the most recent high school graduation rate. And then of those 84 students, we would expect 40 to immediately enroll in a four-year college and 14 additional students to immediately enroll in a community college. And then of those 54 students who immediately enrolled in college after graduating from CPS, we would expect 30 of those students to go on to complete a college credential within six years of their enrollment in college, which is within a decade of their freshman year at CPS. So for reference, the proportion of CPS ninth graders who said 
in a survey that their goal was to earn a college degree is about 78%. So what this means is that if current rates hold fewer than half of the students who would want to go into college and earn a degree um, would complete a credential. However, when we look at the PAI over time, on the next slide here, um, this, this is showing if we retroactively calculated this index under the exact decision rules that we use to calculate this year's index for every single year going back to 2013, um, which allows us to see how the index changes over time, we see a really significant increase from 2013 to 2022, with an especially significant jump up this year in 2022. And this increase reflects a confluence of progress on several different rates, but specifically um, this, this increase this year from the, the index of 27.5% for 2021 up to 29.9% for 2022, mostly reflects um, a, a jump up in the high school graduation rate, um, increases in the college enrollment rate, both in four-year and two-year college enrollment, and also increases in credential completion for community college enrollees. Um, and we'll hear a little bit more about each of those going forward, but all three of those factors have combined for us to see the highest PAI ever this year of 30%. So now that we've seen the high level index, um, what we're gonna do is drill down a little bit into each of the component rates that make up the index, starting with high school graduation. So one thing to keep in mind here for actually all of these metrics is that our rates do differ slightly from those reported by CPS. And that's generally because of slight differences in decision rules and sometimes due to slight differences in data availability. Um, so starting with high school graduation, as many of us know, the high school graduation rate has been increasing really dramatically in Chicago over the past 15 years from about 62% in 2008 to above 80% over the past few years. Um, however, as we saw last year and as we see in this figure, we do see that the high school graduation rate fell slightly in 2021 for the first time in more than a decade, down to 82% in 2021 during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but what we actually see this year uh, in for the 2022 rate is that high school graduation has fully bounced back from where it fell to during the pandemic and is now actually at its highest rate ever of 84%. And it's important to note, like Jenny previewed at the beginning, that these are students who also experienced the pandemic as high schoolers um, when they were in ninth and 10th grade, and that these cohorts of students are still graduating at the highest rate ever for CPS. Um, also wanted to note that this rate of 84% is also approaching the national high school graduation rate across all high schools, which the best available data from NCES puts around 87%. Um, so now we'll turn to look at college enrollment. Um, and we define immediate enrollment in college as enrollment in the summer or fall immediately after students graduate from CPS. So this is one place to note that this does differ slightly from CPS's de definition of immediate enrollment, which includes enrollments in the spring of students first year after graduating from high school. So let's go to the slide here. So we had seen, um, we'd been seeing a very steady increase in immediate enrollment in bachelor's degree granting institutions, which are here in dark green, um, up until 2017 when enrollment began to level off and then de to decline slightly in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, particularly that decline came in 2020 in, two in community college enrollment and two-year college enrollment. Um, but since then, we have seen college enrollment rates begin to increase again. They now stand, as you can see here, at 44% of CPS graduates immediately enrolling in a bachelor's degree granting institution in dark green, and then an additional 17% of students immediately enrolling in community college for a total of around 61% of CPS graduates immediately enrolling in college. Um, 
And uh, one more point of national comparison here. So uh, the, the best available data from NCES says that the national rate is around 62% with 43% immediately enrolling in a four-year college, which is very similar to the CPS rate, um, but then 19%, so slightly higher than CPS enrolling in a two-year college. Um, one other thing to note is that nationally, it, college enrollment rates have been declining slightly, while as we can see, for the most part, they have been increasing over time for CPS graduates. Um, and now finally, we'll turn to college completion, which is the last metric we'll look at here. Um, and this year, uh, we'll look first at completion outcomes just for students who immediately enrolled in bachelor's degree granting institutions, and then separately for students who enrolled in community colleges. Uh, so first, looking here at bachelor's degree granting institutions, uh, we see that the six-year college completion rate among immediate enrollees in four-year colleges has been relatively flat for several years now. Um, it currently stands at about 56% of immediate enrollees completing a credential within six years, 51% completing a bachelor's degree, and then an additional 5% of enrollees completing another credential, such as an associate's degree or a certificate from a community college. Um, that 5% is in light green. Um, one, one thing to keep in mind is that these are the same cohorts of students for whom college enrollment was increasing. So this stable completion rate does actually mean that more students are completing college degrees overall. It also means that more students are leaving college without a degree. When we look at community college enrollees, we see a pretty different story. We actually see a really significant jump up for CPS graduates from the class of 2015 who immediately enrolled in a community college up to around a third, 33% of students completing any credential within six years. Most of that increase has come in the completion of associate degrees and certificates from community colleges, but the number of community college enrollees going on to complete a bachelor's degree within six years has increased slightly as well, up to about 10%. Um, and we're, I think, all looking forward to hearing from Chancellor Salgado about the progress that's happening for CPS graduates at CCC. Um, overall, if we included both the four-year and two-year enrollees um, from the, the, this slide and the slide before, we would see that around 48% of all college enrollees from CPS are going on to complete any credential or degree within six years. And this rate would compare to a national rate of around 62% estimated by the National Student Clearinghouse. That is not a perfect comparison, but it does underline that while CPS has seen significant gains in high school graduation and college enrollment rates that do bring it approximately in line with the nation as a whole on those metrics. Um, on college completion, where rates have continued to be more flat over time for CPS graduates, particularly for four-year college enrollees, CPS students are still completing college at lower rates than the national average. And I think we think this remains the place where there's the most opportunity for progress for CPS graduates. Um, so it, it is important to keep in mind as we look at these rates that the changes over time compound on one another because the denominators for college enrollment rates have changed as more and more students have graduated from CPS and enrolled in college over time. And so now we'll turn to Alex Usher, who's going to help us um, think a moment about what these changes in the rates have actually meant for CPS students, both across student groups and in terms of real numbers of students over time who are going to and graduating from college. Thanks, Shelby. Um, I think we can click ahead to the next slide. Uh, I wanna bring us back here to sort of our anchoring figure for this report, this year's PAI. So this is where Shelby started off. Um, and we've had a chance now to look at the rates more in depth on each of these milestones that go into the index. Um, and I just want to reiterate again what Shelby started out by saying, which is that this 30%, this does not have to be true. And we think it won't be true. Um, this is a snapshot of where we're at now, but there's tons of work that everyone on this call and throughout the city is doing to change these numbers. Um, and we need to focus on changing these rates so that by the time we get to 10 years from now, there are more than 30% of students completing a credential. Um, Another thing to pay attention to is that these rates that we're looking at are averages at the district level. 
So it's really, it's crucial to think about how this applies to different types of students across the district because we know that opportunities and resources and support are not equitably distributed. Um, so there is an opportunity on our website and the interactive webpage to dig into what each of these metrics looks like for students from different backgrounds, including um, race, ethnicity, gender, students who have an IEP, students who are English learners. So we really strongly encourage everybody. <clears throat> and we're going to have time in our post event discussion to do this a little bit and to talk about it. Um, we really encourage you to check out the interactive website and dive into these numbers a little more deeply because it's so important. Um, we're going to do just one quick slide um, that's a little bit of a deeper dive. And again, this is really just scratching the surface. Um, but what we're looking at here is the PAI, so that same number we just looked at, but broken down for students from different race, ethnicity, and gender groups. So I think what we can see here is that there's still a lot of work to be done, and that work needs to focus on the disparities and the unequal outcomes for students from different race, ethnicity, and gender groups. Um, and again, as we talk about wanting to change that 30% number, that 30% college degree completion, um, so that it does not hold true in 10 years, the most important thing that we can do and what we have to do as a city is to work to increase the PAI for Black and Latinx students. Because um, as we can see here, young men from every race ethnicity group have a PAI lower than young women from the same race ethnicity group. And overall, Black and Latinx students have a PAI that's lower than their white and Asian Pacific Islander counterparts. Um, I want to, though, importantly acknowledge here that these differences are the results of racist systems and structures. Uh, we know that students from each race, ethnicity, and gender group have similar self-reported college aspirations. So the differences that we're seeing here are not reflective of students' desires or students' abilities, but rather failures of the system. The system is impacting students differently and allowing different types of students to either access or not access supports and success in the post-secondary system. So again, there's a big opportunity and a push here to do everything we can to ensure that all students have the resources and the support to be successful in both their high school careers and their desired post-secondary plans. And then we're gonna look at one last graph here. Um, this is the same data that you saw on how many students are enrolling into college immediately after finishing high school each year. Um, you can see those years across the bottom. But now instead of percentages, we're looking at raw numbers of students who enrolled in college. And then for the years where we have the data, so the left-hand side of the graph, we overlay on the bars whether or not those students completed a degree and whether it was a bachelor's or an associate's degree or certificate. So I think up to this point, we've talked a lot about percentages, um, but we want to keep really top of mind that we're talking about individual students. So every year, thousands of students are entering into this system and exiting the system in one of two ways, either without a degree or with a degree. And we know that as more students are entering college, there are more students in those blue and green sections of the bars on the left. So there are more students completing degrees every year, um, which is huge. We really want to celebrate that. But because more students are also enrolling into college, there are also more students in the gray bars. So students who are starting college but not completing their degree. So while we've seen this huge growth in the number of college graduates, there's also thousands of students who are starting college every year, amassing debt, and then not completing their degree. So this is really another call to action to continue the work of supporting all students across all groups and backgrounds who start college to finish college. I think with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dom. Great, thank you, team. Um, again, I know this was a very quick uh, run through on the data, so please feel free to keep some of those uh, clarifying questions coming in. And, and again, we're going to have some more time uh, in our post panel discussion to dive into uh, some of those uh, questions as well. Um, all right, uh, so we're going to transition uh, again to trying to get some uh, perspective uh, here to try to put some context behind some of these numbers. We're really excited about the opportunity today. As a team just shared, um, you know, we what we've seen uh, through this year's report is that this is one of the most significant jumps um, that we've seen in recent years. Um, and and as as Alex uh, Usher just just really helped us clarify, you know, while it's a small percentage, you know, this really does have a, a real compounding impact on hundreds of students. Um, and so. Um, you know, I think it is, we, we are always trying to be really clear in our work um, that 
uh, descriptive data like this does a really good job of helping us understand that who, what, where, and when. But oftentimes, it's, it is really difficult uh, to pin down some of that why. And again, as we think about the PAI being a metric that is malleable, right? one, this is a projection. These numbers do not have to be true. We also are really excited about the opportunity to learn about some of the current work that is happening um, uh, at these two respective institutions um, that will give us an opportunity to hopefully uh, see these numbers continue to increase. Um, so we are incredibly excited to be joined uh, by these two leaders, uh, Bogdana Shekambova, Chief Education Officer of Chicago Public Schools, and Juan Salgado, Chancellor of City Colleges of Chicago, uh, to share some of that perspective um, of some of the hard work that their institutions, educators, uh, advisors, families, and most importantly, students themselves uh, have been doing and are continuing to do uh, to make sure that we are continuing to realize some of the gains that we're seeing in the data. So with that, we are going to be starting um, with Chicago Public Schools. And I would like to introduce uh, Chief Chekambova. As Chief Education Officer, Bogdana Chekambova ensures that students across Chicago have access to high quality education, uh, educational experiences that will prepare them for success in college and fulfilling careers. Uh, prior to this role, she served as Chief of Schools Officer and was responsible for managing Chicago's 17 school networks. Uh, ensuring principal quality and strong school performance across the district. Uh, she began her career as a special education teacher at uh, Chopin Elementary and um, was also selected to open the K-8 Disney II Magnet School in 2008 and oversee its expansion to high school in 2012. Uh, Bogdana holds a Bachelor's of Science in Special Education from Southwest uh, University in Bulgaria, a Master's Degree in Education uh, Educational Administration from Governor State University, and soon we get the opportunity to call her uh, Dr. Chikomova as she's pursuing a doctorate in educational leadership from Western Illinois University. So with that, uh, I will pass it over uh, to uh, you, Chief Chikomova. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I want to start by thanking Jenny, Shelby, and Alex for their presentation. And I also want to thank them for hosting this uh, event. Uh, before I get started, um, it is my pleasure to also recognize uh, Chancellor Salgado for being here um, because CPS very deeply values our strong partnership with the City Colleges of Chicago. So I'm looking forward to hear his reflections uh, on this data. Um, this year report uh, is obviously not the first one, and I'm also every year anticipating the release of this report. Um, for probably uh, about a decade now. This makes it really easy for us as a district to track progress and supporting our students and also uh, holds us accountable. Uh, the CPS leaders and all the adults working in the system to ensure that our efforts are positively impacting uh, student outcomes. So when I was organizing my initial thoughts about this year's report, um, I compared it to two other reports in particular. Um, I looked at the last year's report and I also looked at the very first report um, that was released back um, in 2014. So this analysis confirmed what I already uh, believed, which is that CPS made commendable progress over the past year um, and that we have taken uh, even larger strides toward over the past uh, decade. Um, I appreciate that the past few reports have been framed by a single uh, projection, the percentage of current CPS ninth graders who will complete a college credential within 10 years. This piece of information is really, really um, important for all of us because it encompasses all of our essential um, attainment metrics graduation rates, college enrollment, and also college persistence. These are metrics that we as a system have been tracking for uh, a very long time. So I'm, I'm actually very pleased to see that um, it had increased from 27 to 30%. Um, and it's really an indication that we are staying the course of continuously um, um, being effective in supporting our students to earn college credentials. So as we dig um, into the data further, um, you can you know, see some of the uh, reasons why this has increased. Our graduation rates are higher 
Our college enrollment per uh, percentages are increasing again after a dip, um, likely um, due to the pandemic. And also our completion rate is up as well. And we as a system are continuing to build on that ongoing success by expanding a lot of our attention from high school students also down to middle school students. Um, I want to uh, spend a little bit uh, more time now talking about each specific metric and highlighting some of the investments and the strategies that we have in place so we can see the growth uh, that was indicated in this report. Um, first, our four-year graduation rate increased by two percentage points since the previous year. There are countless factors that can impact whether or not a student graduates from high school, uh, but there are several um, efforts that we believe can be connected to this positive trend. First of all, CPS has worked tirelessly to expand high quality programs to keep our students engaged from career and technical education to dual credit courses, to international baccalaureate programs. And we are really focused on expanding opportunities for um, greater number of students. We've also expanded out of school time and extracurricular opportunities for our high school students, because we believe that this supports the exploration of their position, uh, of their passions outside of the classrooms. And we continue strengthening the focus on restorative justice rather than punitive measures to support our students' social emotional needs, reducing barriers that prevent them from succeeding uh, academically. We also made um, effort to support strong practices within our schools, specifically around um, developing strong instructional leadership teams and also making sure that our uh, high schools have strong post-secondary success teams, as well as freshman on track teams. We know that um, the groups um, of our students who are furthest from opportunity are most often our Black and Latino males. It has been um, this way since um, I, was, I started teaching in CPS, which was in the early 2000s. With these groups, especially at the high school level, we've learned that one of the most impactful ways we can provide support is by establishing partnerships that will provide mentorship and guidance to these students throughout their high school experience. And these partnerships, coupled with the increased academic and social emotional uh, supports at the district level and the school level, can be a game changer for decreasing the opportunity gaps. We saw that college enrollment rates increased by 1.5 percentage points over the past um, year. Um, and it was uh, very important um, noticing that the significant increase was actually for Latino male students. We are not still uh, quite at pre-pandemic levels, but we're certainly moving in the right direction. And I can talk about the progress we've made in this area, college enrollment, without highlighting our Learn, Plan, Succeed initiative, because it requires students to uh, create a post-secondary plans while they're in the, uh, in the high schools. And this program um, encourages many of our students to pursue college as the most direct route to achieving their uh, future aspirations. Especially in the wake of the pandemic, I also have to give a lot of credit to our school-based staff, specifically our school principals, teachers, and counselors. Despite the challenges of the past few years, they didn't lose their focus on college and career success. And in my opinion, <clears throat> the post-secondary culture that we have in our schools is stronger than ever. In fact, we recently updated the continuous improvement foundations that each of our schools is creating their own school improvement plan to include an explicit foundation on post-secondary success. So uh, we've been um, in many high schools um, where we have discussed their prioritization um, of strategies and many of our high schools are actually selecting post-secondary success as one of their um, areas that they wanna uh, continuously to um, grow. So this continuous improvement work often centers on providing more opportunities for exposing students to career opportunities, starting 
now not in ninth grade as it was in the past, but pushing it down to middle school and starting this exploration in sixth grade. We will be keeping a close eye on how our schools are implement, implementing these initiatives while thinking also strategically how to scale successful initiatives across uh, the entire district. And last about college completion rates. The most interesting part of this year's re report for me is actually the data about the college completion. Out of every metric, the most eye-opening was the 5.9% point increase in students who earned a degree after immediately enrolling in two-year college after graduating high school. This is a metric that had been more or less flat over the past um, five or six years. So now students, uh, so now uh, students achieving this um, actually is a really impressive indicator for our efforts. The CPS class of 2015 is actually the class behind um, this year's uh, college completion data. So not coincidentally, this was the first year that we offered the STAR scholarship that allowed many of our graduates to attend city colleges cost-free. I believe that college completion, more so than any other of the metrics um, we took, um, we look at closely today, is uh, about CPS removing barriers for our students. It only takes one obstacle to prevent some of our students from uh, earning their degree. And one of uh, the supports that we have added is alumni support. One of the most um, common barriers, as we know, is cost uh, of college. Um, so it makes sense that the STAR scholarship made a big impact on our completion rates. I'm also extremely proud of the work um, that we have done with the City Colleges um, of Chicago to reduce the additional barriers through the Chicago Roadmap, our initiative to promote a maximum level of convergence between our two organizations. And this roadmap is rooted in a number of proven strategies to increase college persistence. Another barrier is student feeling academically unprepared for college level work. So we've expanded transitional English and math courses in our high schools. We know that some students may not see how college is relevant to their interests. So we've also placed post-secondary navigators in our high schools to provide them with support. And we continue to um, expand relationships with other organizations, for example, Hope Chicago, to help more of our students end up at college that are the right fit um, you know, for their aspirations. Um, it's always affirming to see that um, our district's metrics are moving in the right direction, but that doesn't seem uh, doesn't uh, mean that we should become complacent. Uh, we must continue working to ensure stronger progress, especially when it comes to the gaps that remain, opportunity gaps that remain for our Black and Latino students. Equity has been uh, one of our core values for years, and now um, it is up to all of us uh, from our teachers, leading individual classrooms, to principals and district leaders like me um, to put equity um, at the forefront of the work and make sure that this is something that we live by. Um, we actually need to be a lot more intentional and strategic in our work how to reduce um, the opportunity gaps for students. So while as a district we're making progress through the ways we fund schools, the partnerships we're cultivating, the programs we're expanding, there's still a lot more to do. Um, we will continue um, to focus on helping every student regardless of their race, um, zip code and background to achieve success in high school and in post uh, secondary life. So um, with all that, I wanna thank you for giving me an opportunity to share some of my thoughts um, after the release of this uh, report. And I wanna thank the consortium and the To and Through Project uh, for their unwavering support and collaboration uh, to our district. And with all that, um, I will turn it uh, back to Dom. Thank you so much for those insights uh, and, and just a look into the work that's happening. Appreciate that, Chief Chakamoga. Let's transition uh, now to uh, Chancellor Salgado. Uh, 
Juan Salgado is appointed to City College Chancellor 2017 and has focused his 20 year career on improving education and economic opportunities for residents in low income communities. As chancellor, he oversees Chicago's community college system, serving more than 80,000 students across seven colleges, many of them who've had uh, their educational roots in Chicago public schools. Uh, prior to his role as chancellor, uh, Chief, uh, Chancellor Sagado served as CEO of Instituto del Progreso Latino, where he worked to empower residents of Chicago's Southwest side through education, citizenship, skill building programs that led to sustainable employment and economic stability. As a community college graduate himself, Chancellor Salgado earned an associate's degree from Moraine Valley Community College before earning a bachelor's degree at Illinois Wesleyan University and a master's in urban planning at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Chancellor Salgado. Take it away. Thank you, Dom. Uh, and I, want, I really th we want to thank as well, Jenny, and all of your colleagues there at the consortium for the work that you're doing. Um, over the years and spe specifically with this um, report. When I arrived at CCC, actually, I recognized how important it was to partner with organizations like the consortium to help us better understand our student progress. And so, you know, I really take these moments as incredible learning and growth moments for our entire institution. Uh, that's why we developed something we call the learning agenda. That's why we're working with the consortium, with U Chicago's Inclusive Economy Lab, with the Community College Research Center at Columbia, the Aspen Institute, Achieving the Dream, and several others partners to continue to improve our programs and practices. Rest assured, we are a learning institution, um, and this is a wonderful learning opportunity. I do want to acknowledge the incredible work that is going on at Chicago Public Schools under the leadership of CEO Martinez um, and uh, Bogdana, uh, our chief education officer, uh, just has uh, brought tremendous energy, clarity, and partnership to the work. So thank you to you, uh, Bogdana. Uh, we, we, we especially um, appreciate the recognition of the importance of community colleges um, and uh, the incredibly uh, the strong choice, the smart choice uh, that community colleges are and are being seen uh, to be by our uh, Chicago Public Schools partner, partners. It's been an incredibly uh, rewarding experience to work with CPS. As CPS grad student, graduates are City College's students. Their success is our success. Um, their success is our city's success. And so we are thrilled to see that CPS grads keep making progress in college enrollment uh, and completion in spite of the global pandemic. We're delighted to see that CPS graduates at City Colleges um, since your last report have made uh, important gains. Uh, and while that is the case, I wanna be real crystal clear. Crystal clear. Um, we are still dissatisfied with the outcomes and especially the inequity of outcomes. We know we can do better, we will do better. I will tell you some of the things that give us confidence to know um, that that is going to occur. But let me start with, you know, the asset that we are. Uh, we're most, the most accessible higher education engine of social economic mobility and racial equity. Um, we serve, as you heard, a large uh, number of students. When you look at a metric of mobility, that is moving the needle. If you look at Harvard University, Raj Chetty's work in Opportunity Insights, you'll see that we rank among the highest community colleges in the nation in terms of mobility. Um, you'll see that we rank among the highest in, uh, performing institutions of the state of Illinois in terms of mobility, people going from their current state um, of, of, of earning to a future state that is much better, moving up two quintiles, moving up from the bottom all the way to the top. Um, we take pride in that work uh, because that's the work that um, needs to be done in order for us to achieve equity um, in our students and so uh, in our city uh, for our students. And so we want to see um, these outcomes even grow more in the future. We have set a universal completion goal in four-year student attainment outcomes of 55% by 2032. We are very serious about achieving that goal. 
that uh, uh, reality today uh, is that our black students are completing at a rate of 30% and our Latinx students at a rate of 33%. And so, uh, you know, watch this grow and you'll see this further reports in the future uh, 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 you know, demonstrate the good work that we're doing here at City Colleges of Chicago. How are we gonna get there? I wanna make sure it's real clear. We've got a strategy, we've got a plan. Here are the highlights where, you know, we are going to uh, hit the 55% completion. And you'll see that in future reports that the consortium puts out. Um, we're going to grow in bold and scalable ways in high demand sectors that provide good upwardly mobile careers. Um, education, um, engineering, <laughs> where, by the way, we've already grown from 25 students five years ago to 500 plus students in pre-engineering today. You'll see that grow to 1,000, 1,500 students. In healthcare, in allied healthcare, uh, where, by the way, um, you know, Malcolm X College sees the most students passing the ADA and licensure exam than any other public community colleges in the state with an average 90% pass rate over the last seven years. We're going to grow nursing. We're going to grow allied health. Um, and those are also high uh, levels of retention and high levels of upward mobility. We've already grown information technology, cybersecurity, data science, cloud computing, AI machine learning by 181% in credit tech programs since 2018, 2019, and continuing education by 641% since FY19. Look for that to grow even further. By the way, um, it's 40% Black, 30% Latinx. Um, in credit, 45% uh, Latinx, 26% Black. So, you know, our diversity is as strong in those careers as it is in many of our other careers as well. Um, public sector as well. We've got a policing program done by our social justice faculty. Um, you, you know, it is not just filling those positions, but filling those positions with people from our community, from our community colleges, um, leading to uh, high wage um, opportunities in the future. Our, our student supports have never been more robust and so you're gonna see more student support. We have more mental health supports, wellness center supports, after hours telehealth, academic related supports in terms of tutor, but not just tutors, embedded tutors and evening tutors and weekend tutors, um, you know, liaisons for targeted populations like undocumented students, students that need access to benefits and housing insecure students, um, not just food pantries, but a strategy to make sure that our students are food secure. And we've launched, um, you know, a, a great partnership with um, One Million Degrees to expand student support at many of our institutions. Um, and so, you know, uh, we're committed to equity. Look, we haven't raised tuition since 2019. I mean, I'm sorry, um, 2016. Uh, and, uh, and as was mentioned before, between STAR Scholarship and Future Ready and a new um, uh, program that we rolled out with CPS, uh, options for the future scholarship for our option students to be able to have a community college education at no cost to them. Uh, you know, these are the strategies that we're employing. Bagnana talked about um, uh, you know, go, the Chicago roadmap, so I won't go into great detail um, about the specifics of the Chicago roadmap. I will just say that it is producing incredible results uh, for our learners. We're seeing uh, direct enrollment from CPS to CCC increase uh, by 30% between the 2021 class and the 2022 class. Um, I want you to know that uh, Olive Harvey is 24% over pre-pandemic fall to fall enrollment um, from 2022 to 2023. Um, Malcolm X and Kennedy King uh, 14 percent over pre-pandemic enrollment this fall and we're seeing black male student enrollment up. we're seeing black female student enrollment up by double digits um, as a result of this work we're seeing a 94 percent increase in uh, option students enrolling at city colleges of chicago um, and rest assured if these students that we are reaching do not enroll in city colleges of chicago they're likely not to enroll anywhere um, at all. And so um, I, I just want to close by saying we're making headway. 
but we've got to continue to be intentional about achieving equity. We are very serious about hitting our goal. And you will see that in the data in future years to come. But yeah, we're celebrating that we've hit an all-time high, but we've got lots more work to do. I love it. That's a great, great note to end on. Thank you, Chancellor Sagal, for joining us. Um, as we close, I uh, want to extend uh, just uh, another uh, thank you for that perspective to provide some of that insight, some of the amazing work that's happening across our city on behalf of our students. Um, a few closing notes. Um, as I, you know, I hope it, it's been abundantly clear. And as we just heard from these two leaders, um, there's an opportunity to really celebrate uh, the work that is happening, um, the change that has happened in Chicago, uh, full stop. And uh, as, as Chancellor Sagato just, just mentioned, there's still a tremendous amount of work to do. That is work that, you know, I have the pleasure of being able to see uh, all the people, all the amazing leaders, educators, advisors that are on this call today. Um, it is work that we are all engaging in in real time. And this is a very exciting moment uh, for Chicago uh, to continue to push against the narrative of who college is for and what college can be uh, for all of our students. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, a, a couple closing notes. Uh, one, uh, again, we are here to support um, uh, the consortium and the Two and Through Project. Uh, our work is trying to support. Um, we have this uh, beautiful opportunity to work with many of the people here on this call. Um, if there are opportunities for questions or opportunities to take a look at our resources, please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, that is why we are here. Um, and finally, for those, again, uh, for folks that would like to continue this conversation. Um, we are in about two minutes. We will be transitioning over to uh, a, our post-event discussion. The link for that Zoom room is in the chat. Uh, it should also be uh, on, uh, should be a, a calendar invite for those who RSVP. Uh, this again will give us an opportunity and give you an opportunity to see some of your colleagues that were on the call today and have a, a brief uh, starting conversation around some of the opportunities that exist for us to continue to plug in and respond uh, for our students. Thank you again for all of the work uh, that you all are doing on behalf of Chicago's young people. Um, and we are very much looking forward to seeing everyone uh, next year uh, for our 10th uh, annual update. With that.